Hey, JD here. Welcome to the Mead House. You know, over the past several years, we've watched you over 125 episodes of mead making, education, information, and entertainment. More than 80 guests have stopped by the Mead House. Professional mead makers, medal winning home mead makers, competition organizers, experts on yeast, and honey specialists have all visited to share their knowledge. The Mead House is produced for home mead makers and brewers looking for a bit of inspiration and information from the many guests and discussions we have here at the house. You can help support the Mead House by joining the Mead House Keyholder Club on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for the Mead House. There's also a link in the show notes. For as little as two bucks a month, you can become a keyholder. We've teamed up with some great companies to provide thank you gifts for your support. So get on over to Patreon, join the Mead House Keyholder Club, and get your own set of keys to the Mead House. Hey, you can listen to the Mead House podcast with your favorite player and be sure to rate us five stars on iTunes or your favorite listening venue. The Mead House. Mead making entertainment you just don't want to miss. talk about just before the clear beer draught system is a patented floating intake that replaces your keg's long dip tube it's designed to draw beer from the top surface in the keg that's where the clearest cleanest and best tasting beer is from the first pull on the tap panel to the last every glass is clean and free of trub and sediment drop hop pellets in for added flavor and aroma and never worry about a clogged dip tube again Clear Beer Draught System is available at, you guessed it, clearbeardraughtsystem.com. If you're a kegger like me, you need to get the Clear Beer Draught System. I'll tell you, it works outstanding. I got a couple of them in my kegs. I highly recommend it. Hey, welcome to the Mead House, and thanks for listening to episode number 130. You can catch the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher Radio, including a whole lot of other places. You know where they're listed. At TheMeatHouse.com. The Mead House is produced for home mead makers and brewers looking for a little bit of inspiration and information from the many guests and discussions we have here at the house. Hey, talk to us. We're on Facebook and Twitter, both at The Mead House, or you can just email us at info at TheMeatHouse.com. Hey, Jeff and Ryan are both seated at the bar. My name is J.D. Webb, and in this episode, he not only makes meads, but he also wins beard contests. And we've got a couple of pictures for the show notes that will explain this completely. So be sure and check them out. And if you've seen pictures of me on Facebook or at the Iron B, maybe I'll get some pointers from him for mine. Hey, in this episode, you'll meet Iron B champ Burt Meyer. In segment two, hollowed out tree stumps, clay pots, and ceramic containers. Well, I don't know about the hollowed out tree stumps, but the others I know were used as fermentation and storage vessels. This segment, we tackle a couple of questions about fermentation and storage from a couple of listeners and key holders. And if we get some time, Facebook friends, this is where we try to answer a few questions based on no formal expertise other than what the three of us have experienced in our own brew house, all that and more here at the Meat House. But first, hey, thanks to all the Meat House key holders who help keep the Meat House podcast free. You too can become a Meat House key holder and help support the show for as little as two bucks a month. We've got some great thank you gifts to send you. Get on over to patreon.com, search for the Meat House, or just click on the show notes, uh, link in the show notes. Hey, what are we drinking tonight? Hey, in my one hand, uh, bourbon tonight. Uh, it's Elijah Craig, Kentucky Straight Bourbon. This is 94 proof. It's good stuff. Uh, brown sugar on the nose. It's smooth as glass. Uh, Elijah Craig, uh, this is small batch, uh, 1789. Been around a long time. In my other hand, uh, I've got a little something from uh, from Jeff. Uh, Jeff, this is a Belgian strong golden braggot, young. Uh, mm. I love the malt, man. Wow. Mm-hmm. Malty. There's some great malt flavor there. Mm. Um, are you catching any honey character? A little bit. A little bit. A uh, little bit on the nose. But man, it's good. It's got a little sweetness to it, um, but I love mm-hmm. that malt. Um, it almost. What what else did you put uh, in this? Any hops? So this I, is, I, there's something. Yeah, else this in is there. pretty simple. Um, there's uh, like you've detected. There is a ton of pilsner malt in there. Um, mm-hmm. That's really the backbone of this guy. 
Then uh, I also used the last uh, probably 20 pounds-ish of my blueberry varietal honey in there. So that's going to give mm. it a little bit of that berry character on the nose. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's about three ounces of stearia and goldings that I did in a hop stand for around about half an hour at 180. Perfect. Um, so there's a little bit of bitterness there. I'm kind of expecting that to fade a little bit, maybe leave a little bit of that hop character. Um, but it's a nice, mellow little hop that's really common in uh, Belgian beers, so it seemed like a fitting alternative. I'm sorry, a fitting addition to your. Um, and then I used some uh, some Belgian Ardennes yeast that uh, it, it's also thrown some really beautiful, like little fruity character in there. So um, really looking forward to this one. I uh, I intend to age this one quite a while before mm. I really get to enjoying it. Uh, probably something I'll hang on to for until at least the fall, if not the winter. Um, have a nice, you know, warmer, um, a little on the lighter side, but uh, uh, it was so good right before the Iron B when I just kind of I gave myself a little taste and was like, okay, the, the, this keg is already kind of heavy, or this uh, fermenter is already a little heavy with the the volume, so I'll better put a couple of small bottles uh, in for uh, mm -hmm. JD and Ryan here and let them get a little sample on this guy too. Oh yeah, you got a killer here. I mean, this, this stuff is really good. The only the only uh, yeah, well, not really a problem, but I, I don't know how far you uh, did you keg it. Did you carb it in the keg, or uh, it wasn't quite no. carbed? It uh, was not carbed at all. Uh, if you're getting any, it's a um, little bit, little bit. If you're getting any bubbling, that's just from from sitting in a bottle for the last month or so. Mm. Um, it, it kind of doing its secondary in the bottle. Um, mm -hmm. It has been. I uh, I actually started a uh, rosé project that I, I basically put this guy into secondary um, just a couple of days ago and then mixed up another one to dump right on top, top of that same uh, uh, yeast strain just to uh, – I really like that character it was given. So, um, yeah, I'm digging this, man. Yeah, no, this is, this is kind of moving into uh, um, long-term storage just now, and I figure once it gets to where I want it to be and I just can't – to, to hold on to it any longer i'll probably take it up and carve it at that point yeah i you know uh i mean not you know i mean it doesn't have to be carved out the yin yang uh but what little bit is here i just wish there was a little bit more um mm -hmm. and i love how it finishes dry it's good there's some residual sweetness but it doesn't leave you with that sugar taste in, in your mouth uh I, I, dude i'm digging this man this is really good really good it's a nice one i'm very pleased with it. Absolutely. So uh, what did you put in your cup? So as usual, double fisting it and uh, playing the co-host roulette tonight. Um, I, I think I've drank one of the one that uh, I got from you, JD, before. But, you know, in my um, in my poor uh, uh, practices here, I kind of forgot what each of these bottles were so um i have a, a little good. bottle from you with a bright red cap on it good luck uh, yeah. It out to a glass. <laughs> yeah it's a uh kind of a deep um almost reddish copperish brown um from the okay. flavor i'm guessing this is that blackberry um, there you go blackberry uh braggot yeah um, it's got some of that nice uh, blackberry character to it and um good maltiness um real enjoyable yeah. Then in the other glass, uh, the one I got from Ryan, um, this was in a bottle uh, with a little piece of uh, tape over it that just says PW. Um, it's bright pink, very, very carbonated, um, kind of bubbling away like a, uh, a nice glass of champagne here. I'm guessing the P stands for passion fruit because I'm getting a lot of that both on the nose and um, just across the palate. Uh, it finishes a little bit dry, which is perfect. Um, and yeah, this is, this is really nice, man. Thank you. So was Thank I right you. about the passion fruit? Um, you know, I'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Deal. Excellent. Well, Ryan, what did you put in your glass? You know, before I get into what's in my glass, uh, a little bit ago, I got a text from Adam Bystrom. You know, he was on our show last week. And right. Adams just, I had sent him home with a, a cooler of, of bottles. And he texted me and said, hey, I'm drinking your 14-pound 
break it. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's delicious. You know, it's it's great. And I had said, you know, that's not bad for a demo beer. I brewed that braggot when I was doing a, a mead brewing demonstration. Um, and, you know, and I was talking to some of the other guys who were doing who brew demonstrations, like from homebrew shops. They just dump it out. You know, they, they, well, they, they do the demonstration, you know, and they don't want to, like, bring this, bring the work back with them. So they just kind of, like, dump it down the drain. And I was like, wow, well, you know, if that's what I'm, if that's what uh, folks typically do, this is, this is really good stuff. Wow. wow. Um, well, last year, the way I brewed this was the Bacon and Beer Classic. I was doing a brew demonstration at the Bacon and Beer Classic in St. Paul. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing that up is it is about that time again. The Bacon and Beer Classic is July 20th at CHS Field in downtown St. Paul. Andrea and I will be back again this year as the official homebrew demonstrators uh, representing the Meat House. Awesome. Um, so stop on by. Uh, the website is baconandbeerclassic.com. It's spelled out, baconandbeerclassic.com. Uh, it's, they've got 30-plus restaurants that all make bacon-inspired dishes, 65-plus breweries, unlimited sampling you know, eating and sampling you know for the afternoon and here's what's pretty cool bring in a non-perishable food item and they give you a coupon for a free package of uh, black label bacon oh wow so, uh you got you've got some some great stuff there check that out uh bacon and beer classic.com make sure to come say hi to me and andrea as we're brewing i don't know what i'm gonna make if you've got a suggestion of what i should be making uh, let me know. I was kind of thinking I might do a a white stout imperial braggot. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Maybe I'll do two. Maybe I'll set up side by side uh, stations and and knock a couple out since I know I've got a dedicated afternoon to brew. So I will. Um, but yeah, let me know what you think I should do and and uh, stop by and see me. Um, Very good. What I have in my cup tonight is the PW, the same one Jeff is drinking. <laughs> Great PW, minds think alike. PW stands for party wine. Party. <laughs> it, it, is a, it is a party wine. It is, yeah, it's hyper carbonated. It is uh, champagne carbonated. It's very dry. Um, mm -hmm. It is kind of a fruit salad mead, and I achieve that dryness with Brett. So, Jeff, let me know if you're getting any of the Brett in there. It's my, you know, I'm, I'm drinking it cold. I like this one cold. Mm -hmm. um, not sure what temperature you have, but is that uh, is that Brett dancing across your palate? You know, the, now that I'm I'm tasting something sour, and I, I initially wrote that off as fruit, the Brett character is kind of light. I'm also drinking this very cold because, yeah, no, it, it that's how I like it as well. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of getting that sourness character to it. There's not really a lot of the, the classic Brett Barnyard character, but I don't think I would like it. Uh, I think the the sourness kind of adds a nice little finished note to it. It's just very crisp and dry at the end. Um, so yeah, no. I now that you mentioned the bread, yeah, I can kind of I can kind of grab that. So Excellent. that's so that's what okay. I think there's one in I think there's one in my small keg grader labeled PW. So that's what it is. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest tonight, uh, Iron B secret ingredient gold medalist Bert Mayer. Uh, Bert's been making mead since he turned 21. How convenient! I uh, I wonder if I wonder if that's an embellishment at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, when all his friends brought setups to make beer, his small apartment pushed him in a different direction. I get it. I had a small place for a while, and and my first batch was like one gallon of cider. So I you know I I understand when you you uh, are limited by space. A mild hobby at first, he spent more of his time in the underground <clears throat> world of facial hair competitions. Since retiring from that after the World Championships in 2017, you know, I think I got invited to those. Those were, I think, in Prague. Um, but my uh, my Van Dyke didn't get me out of regionals. 
Um, <laughs> he has turned his focus back to the art of making mead, taking classes at UC Davis and the American Honey Tasting Society, as well as becoming a steward captain at the Mazer Cup with hopes of someday opening a small tap room, a rolling five-year plan. He hopes to just keep making things people enjoy drinking. Well, I hope he enjoys drinking them as well. Uh, welcome to the show, Bert, and uh, what's in your cup tonight? First off, thanks for having me, and that party wine sounds awesome. Um, I, I actually just got back from a trip from North Carolina, so I'm doing a little beer and a shot of stuff that I brought from there. I've got a uh, brute IPA called Brutiful Beast from Jackalope. And then I've got uh, an American malt whiskey from Corsair. They're triple smoke. And it's a really good combination. <laughs> mm. Nice. Yeah, I usually do. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, there's a, there was a, a bar not far from here when I was a lot younger. For five bucks, they did a bump and a beer. And I think it was uh, PBR and, and Jim Beam. <laughs> so, sounds like yours a little bit better. A couple of standbys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Bert, I think the burning question on everybody's mind to start us off tonight, have you ever made a mead with cultured yeast from your beard? <laughs> I have not, no. <laughs> I need to team up with the road guys to do that. Yeah, I've seen. I'm looking at some pictures here, and we'll have we'll have one on uh, on the website. But yeah, you've got uh, uh, some pretty impressive uh, stylings there as well. Um, Thank you. First things. So, does would you say that the mead uh, enhances the beard? Does it give it a nice shine, or or uh, <laughs> or does it is it just used as as a conditioning agent? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the leftover honey that's on my hands after every batch. You just kind of rub on your face, and, you know, it, it gets that nice uh, silky smoothness. <laughs> nice sheen, yeah. I mean, some of these defy gravity. Oh I, I imagine you'd, you'd need something, you know, probably a little thicker than orange blossom, maybe some mesquite or clover <laughs> to keep it in that position. Yeah, and the, the avocado for the mustache, it darkens it, makes it stand out a little bit. <laughs> have, you seen pictures, have, have you seen pictures of me? at all i have yes so my beard is it does it qualify for some kind of artful design so at, at the competitions if you guys really want to know there's uh anywhere from like four to 21 categories depending on which competition you're entering oh, uh, at the world level there's there's a lot more competition so it, it breaks it down by length uh if you want to curl your mustache if you want to style everything if you don't have a mustache if you just have a goatee there's there's actually a category for everybody and there's uh the bigger competitions usually have a fake category for like the wives and the girlfriends so or anybody <laughs> really that wants to show up and kind of hang out oh my god i can't believe we're talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> good stuff. Uh, this is great. Bert, congratulations on your gold medal win. Uh, what Thank did you. what did you think of the competition? Um, I mean, as you weren't there, but but from being a participant of of kind of going into it blind, getting the secret ingredient, kind of deciding how you were going to use the the fenugreek to craft yours. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I've been waiting for a competition like this, honestly. Like, I, I love it when somebody challenges you to make something with, with this. And this, honestly, wasn't something that I had ever really been familiar with. So getting thrown an ingredient that's that's completely out of left field to me, uh, I, th I feel like, uh, I don't know, it, re it really challenges you. And it, it puts you in a unique position to try to, to, to bring out your A game. Excellent. Uh, we all tried yours, and and we all thought it was fantastic. And and uh, I think you know between the first round and the final round, like five world class meat judges all tried it, and all were were really impressed with it. Um, as um, we've mentioned on earlier episodes, Susan Rood of Prairie Rose Meadery and and Al Boyce. Uh, who's you know, one of the higher ranking judges in the BJCP, um, were both also really impressed with what you had done there. So, so kudos to you. Um, you know, what, how did you start thinking about it, this ingredient that was kind of foreign to you and, and uh, end up with what you did? So I, I mean, 
compared to other people, I mean, you may say that I've cheated, but I made more than one batch. I, I, you guys gave us more than enough ingredient to do, to do one batch. So, um, I kind of based the first thing that I made off of, uh, a recipe that I did that did really well in competitions before that. So I did, um, a partial boche. I kind of, I, I caramelized some of the honey and, uh, and then I, I, I think I used a wildflower for the rest of that. So I, I used a mesquite honey. Yeah, I've, I've got my notes in front of me. So I used a mesquite honey, and then um, I caramelized that with the fenugreek seed in it. And mm. uh, and then I used the I used some sweet clover honey uh, and some mesquite honey to round out the rest of that. So I think it was it was just under three three cups of honey in a one gallon batch. And then I made a second batch that uh, was just like a fenugreek tea. So I boiled the fenugreek in the water, and then I added the honey after that cooled down, and I, I fermented that. The The boche kind of came out sweeter than what I normally like, and the tea came out completely bone dry. So what I did afterwards was I blended the two together to kind of get one product that I really liked, and that's what I ended up sending you guys. Well, well I, I just want to say, you know, you there was absolutely no no cheating that, no. that you described there. No. I mean, you might, you know, kind of, you know, your, I don't know. Like, your process. Sometimes of people might think that, but the, you know, you, you made the mead, you know, so it was, it was you who was crafting it. And, uh, you, you know, so there was, that's really the, the rules as, as we lay them out, you know, it's as long as it wasn't someone else's mead that you were doctoring, you know, from a commercial or home mead maker. And it was, something that that you fermented uh and made then um no there's there's that there's no you know cheating in that i you right. I, I know you're speaking kind of facetiously but i don't want anyone listening yeah. to somehow think that blending blending needs is uh is is not appropriate for competition no and i think it's actually something that if if you're looking to get metals i feel like it's something that a lot more people should start trying to do uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, I've, I've talked on the show before, but I, I don't do it quite as much, but I used to have gallons of me, just single gallons of traditional that were either dry or sweet and would blend those in with larger batches to, um, to achieve kind of the level of sweetness that I needed, um, to, to finish something off. So yeah, there's, uh, it's a great tool to have. It's a great, um, it's a great way to uh, to do that, uh, especially if you've got maybe some different varietals and, and you want to bring something out. Um, totally. Tell us about your mead making. You've, you've been making mead for for t- since you were twenty one. I'm air quoting yeah. there because I you know yeah. it's kind of funny how that <laughs> lined up. Uh, but you know, tell us about uh, tell us about your your mead making journey. Yeah, I mean, so so honestly, for probably the first. Uh, eight years or so, like I would make a couple batches a year. I would make a gallon here, a gallon there. I'd throw it in the, in the, the closet and I'd kind of just let it sit. And I was always really impatient and I would drink it probably before it was really good. Um, and it, it, I really just didn't focus on it. Uh, and then in the last couple of years, um, I, I took the advanced mead making course at UC Davis and I took a, a course that would, that was supposed to help you, learn how to taste honey better and, and pick out varietals. And, and I, I've just been trying to, to develop my palate because in all honesty, I really don't think it's anywhere near some of the other people that I've, that I've run into while doing this. Um, so I'm just trying, I'm playing, I'm trying to play catch up. Um, and then since, since then I've, I've, I mean, I'm looking at probably 48 gallons of meat in my basement right now. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, there, there's a lot more of it in my life now. Uh, I, I, I tend to stick a lot more in the experimental category um, just because I, I like doing that. I got a couple barrels uh, and I always try to keep those filled. I I like experimenting with Brett. I like doing the Bochets and kind of all three of those things put together keep you in that one category. I've tried to submit those things to other categories and they, they always get knocked because I, I put them in the wrong place. So that, that's kind of where I'm at right now. So tell so tell me about um, you, know, you said you a lot in the experimental category. Tell me a little bit uh, more about some of those things. I think all, all three of us are kind of intrigued by uh, you know meads that that kind of can like you can only fit in that experimental category. 
Um, what have you tried that's worked well? And, and maybe what have you tried that uh, hasn't worked quite as well? Um, well, I mean, I, I started out with just some normal, um, just just making kind of a traditional and putting it in a in a barrel. So the first thing I ever did was I got a, a Tuttletown distillering barrel. That's the, the Hudson Baby Bourbon up in the Hudson Valley, New York. And when I went up there to pick up the barrel, I grabbed some honey from like a local farm and I decided to make something in, entirely based out of the Hudson Valley. So I, 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 I mean, the water wasn't from there, but the, the honey and the barrel were all from there. That did decent in competitions. So I kind of continued that trend. I did another um, traditional, I did raspberry blossom honey. I put it in that same barrel. From there, I, I did uh, a boche after that, I think. Um, the next thing that's in there right now is, um, that, that barrel has been used more than it should be, but I, I tried doing this weird thing where I harvested a yeast culture out of a Jester King beer bottle. And, uh, that had a lot of like weird Brett characteristics and all this weird stuff. And I put that in there and it, it, it was funky cause I wanted it to be, but it just didn't turn out good. I've still got that sitting in a carboy and I'm just trying waiting for a day for me to be able to do something with it and then i made a second batch with that same yeast but i added fruit and i have realized that brett really plays better when you add some other thing besides honey for it to to work on uh and so the second batch that i did with that same yeast cake actually came out a lot better uh, and that was like a plum a sour plum mead that came out of that barrel and then um the other things that i've done for the experimental category, I did the, I did that quarter boche. Uh, I did a bigger batch of that that was barrel aged. Um, I've done a, a sizer with the sweet clover honey, which I think is really cool because it's already got this natural cinnamon taste. Um, and I barrel aged that. Um, but I, th I think the biggest reason that my barrels that'll always end up in the, the experimental category is because I leave them in there for so long. I, I love the liquor flavor that you get from those. And it's not so much the oak and the tannin that I'm trying to get, but it's it's the bourbon or the rum or or whatever whatever liquor you you, you can get out of that barrel. That's what I want. Uh, and so I kind of get knocked a lot for for saying that it it, it it doesn't taste oaky. It tastes liquory, and not a lot of judges really like. <laughs> <laughs> Have, are you are you? Uh, these are five gallon barrels. Uh, I've got one five gallon. I've got one ten gallon, and I'm and I'm thinking about picking up another five gallon right now. Yeah. Um, and then for the for the the Iron B, actually, I used one of the uh, the oak spirals that you guys gave out for um, one of your tiers. You know, one of the uh, I, I've got a couple of barrels here at home. Uh, both of them are Balcones barrels, uh, and they're former uh, whiskey barrels. And I, I did a I did an ale. Um, I guess it came out all right. The guys liked it. Uh, I, I didn't particularly. I mean, it was good. I mean, you know, I drank it and everything, but I, I wasn't particularly thrilled with it. It wasn't quite what I was looking for because, like you say, it had it had more of, of the of the whiskey flavor, uh, and I was looking for a little more of the barrel part. But I, I'm mm -hmm. not. Uh, you know, and this kind of led me down a path that I, I, I don't know. Well, I've actually got another thing going on here with a barrel that's clean, a clean, fresh charred barrel with nothing in it. Uh, got another project going. Uh, I, I wasn't, you know, I was looking for that vanilla and, and you know, those char the, the barrel character, and I never got it really. Totally. Uh, and I think. You know, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if this is the right thing to say or not. Or I mean, I don't know if I'm correct in saying this, but you know, these these used barrels, they're they're being given up for a reason because they're used, and mm -hmm. you know, it may be the last hurrah, uh, you know, uh, for that barrel, and then whatever else you put in it after that will just take on the flavor of what was in the barrel before. Uh, you know, you may have to leave it in there for another couple of years, maybe, I guess, uh, you know, and see if you can extract any of that barrel character out. But, I mean, is that uh, – what, what's your thoughts on that whole on the whole thing? I mean, I've, I've, I've talked to a few different people about this, and it, and uh, the, I, I have gone to a lot of commercial meteries too, which, which I encourage everybody to do, 
talk to as many people as you possibly can. Um, but there, I know there's a few different meteries that are using barrels in, in mm-hmm. kind of different ways that, that kind of, are, they're, they're trying to pull out those different characteristics. So, I mean, one, one of my favorite ones that I always go to is sap house metery mm-hmm. and, um, they're, when when they get barrels um one of their techniques is kind of like the uh they'll take a just a, a wildflower honey they'll they'll make a wildflower traditional and they'll put that in the barrel and they'll let that age and then when they take that out the that's where you'll kind of figure out what that barrel is going to do you're it's it's going to pull out a little bit of the the liquor flavor whatever it was that was in there and it, and it's going to give you kind of the characteristics of that barrel. So then you can taste that wildflower and then you can kind of go back and look like, well, maybe this will be really good with, uh, a buckwheat or it'll be really good with an avocado or it'll be really good with, uh, uh, a sweet clover or, or anything. And, and it gives you that opportunity to kind of realize what this barrel really is before diving head head first into completely yeah. something that, that you might not know pairs with it. Um, on the other end, I know, um, down in Virginia, like, uh, Silverhand Meadery, they, uh, I, I'm sure plenty of other meteries do this, but they were the first one that I went to that actually got their own fresh barrels. Kind of like you were saying, they, there was no spirit in it. They had them, they had barrels actually made for them and they were going specifically just for that Oak char. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, again, it's, I mean, are you, are you going with French oak? Are you going with Hungarian oak? Are you going with like what? There's there's so many different roots. Are, right. Is it a, is it a is it a heavy char? Is it a is it a light char? Like it's every single barrel is going to be different. And I I kind of think that's that's where Sap House has it right. Where you're you're going to need to put something in there or at least buy, buy like when you buy a barrel, maybe it's like just get the liquor that came out of it taste of that and see what you're actually going to get before because yeah. I, I feel like a lot of people get a barrel and then they don't actually know what they're going to do with it because now they get a barrel and that's kind of just the next cool thing to have but <laughs> yeah. like it, it, it's it's just kind of a step up they don't really know what uh what they're going to get from it so it, it, it's almost like a, a the training wheels yeah something guess, for, uh, something that i did um I, you know, the second barrel had a stout in it and it had been in there for about 10 months. I just racked it the other day. Uh, it's got a wonderful taste to it, but again, not quite. I mean, after 10 months, I I was expecting more and maybe I didn't leave it in there long enough. But mm-hmm. what I did was I, I had some little uh, uh, pieces of uh, oak spiral soaking in some bourbon and uh, so I dropped, uh, you know, a, a little oak spiral in the keg to see if I can get that going just a little, just a little bit more of that wood, that oak flavor. So, but good stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm glad, you know, you're thinking outside the box, um, you know, and uh, this is, that's something that we love hearing people talk about here at the Mead House. Yeah, I mean it's it's I think I think that what that's kind of what drives a lot of people and I've 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 had plenty of experiences where people tell me like hey don't do that and when somebody says that to you you almost want to do it more right <laughs> yeah yeah it, it's like I I almost I have there's actually a couple of homebrew shops that I won't shop at anymore because they just tell you that you're wrong and it's like there's yeah. there's these guys out there that they're they're trying to sell you this product but they they're trying to tell you what you're doing isn't the right thing and it, I'd much rather go into a homebrew shop and say like, Oh man, I want to try this. And they're like, Oh, you know, what would be awesome with that. Try some of this with it. And they want to, they kind of want to push you even further mm-hmm. than what you can do. And though th- I think those are the people that you really want. And I mean, I feel like everybody in the meat community does that. I, there's, there's very few people that I've run to around here that, that, that say like, Oh, that's an, that's a very stupid idea. Don't do that. And everybody's mm-hmm. like, Hey, try that. Let me know how it came out. And then I want to do it. A lot of experts out there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something you said earlier, uh, I want to explore a little bit further here, uh, Bert. This is um, going back to your caramelizing the honey. You said you put the fenugreek in the honey? I did, yeah, when how, I was doing the boche. How, how did that – how was how the honey uh, when you were done with, with, with the heating process? Did, it, did the fenugreek add uh, – uh that flavor to the honey at all or how do you feel about that um so i honestly it it, it was kind of one of those things so i i 
boiled the honey with the fenugreek in it and then i i mixed the whole must up because mm-hmm. it, you can't you can't let the the, the caramelized honey sit for too long because right. then it'll actually like solidify um so i cooled it down with the with the water and i mixed the whole must up and then i strained it out and it was maybe it was just too hot still or too too warm when i when i was trying it then but it would it was um I, I, it was it was still kind of a little bit hard to pick out, and that's that that was the main reason that I wanted to do that second batch with the with the tea. I wanted something that was going to really showcase the fenugreek because I thought that was the whole point of the competition. Yeah. So I, I the, the the tea mead was almost a backup plan, um, and and I I think I definitely got a little bit of the the at first I didn't know that uh, artificial maple was the whole point of fenugreek. That's, somebody told me that afterwards. They were like, "Yeah, people use that for fake fake maple all the time." And I was like, "Oh, yeah. well, I wish I knew that. I would have used maple syrup or something." <laughs> but um, I, I, yeah. I, I've got a I've got a honey maple mead that I made. Um, and if if I if I I would say if I caramelized that, it would be pretty similar to what I I ended up with. Um, so I, I definitely think that caramelizing the honey with the fenugreek did something. Um, but not enough to showcase the actual um, ingredient. Something you might want to try uh, if you haven't already. There's a uh, now Ryan. You're gonna have to help me out here. Uh, you know, I'm old and gray and forgetful. But there's a there's a uh, barrel uh, a company out there that makes these staves uh, that has these um, different flavors of wood like cherry wood maple wood uh american oak uh i dropped a small they make these they make these little little pieces that are small enough to drop into like a 750 milliliter bottle uh, of Mm -hmm. liquor well i dropped a maple piece of maple into some just plain old apple cider apple juice and hmm. I'll be damned if that thing, I let it sit in there for like six, seven weeks. And let me tell you, the, the maple flavor that came out of a little chunk of wood uh, was amazing. So get your hands. It was, I believe it was a hard maple. Brian, do you remember the name of that company? Yeah, that's uh, Black Swan. Yes. Uh, and they, yeah, have these honeycomb sticks. And they've got, you know, they've, I think they've even got, so honeycomb sticks go in your, your, um, you know, carboys, but then they've got these barrel, uh, not barrel, um, spirit spirals. Spirit spirals, they're, yes, they're, yes, yes. They're little mini spirals that are, that are intended to go into bottles. So, you know, if you, you know, want to take a 12 year scotch and make it like a 25 year scotch, you know, you, you toss one of these in for a couple of weeks or something. But it's, uh, it's, I haven't tried that on a bottle level, but I have used their stuff before, um, in carboys and, mm-hmm. and I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later about, about, uh, in segment two or three. Um, uh, but I, I'm a big fan of, of using, um, those oaking products. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. Jump in, Jeff. Go ahead. Yeah, I was looking at your uh, your bio here, and you mentioned uh, taking some courses with the it was the American Honey Tasting Society. Um, yes, and I, you know, I'm not I'm not terribly familiar with them as an organization. I did some some looking on my own. It looks like they've got a pretty extensive little sensory gloss here. Um, as a past participant, can you can you tell us about you know some of your inputs as to uh, uh, what you thought of the course and what you got out of it as a meat meat maker? Yeah, so I mean it it. it I, I don't think many people are familiar with it. Um, it is a small little, uh, I guess, company in uh, Connecticut. Uh, so they were pretty local to me. It was easy for me to get down there. Uh, and I work in New York City a lot. So I, I actually was working down there for the week, and I just went back to Connecticut for the weekend. Um, and it was basically, it was a two-day course. Uh, it's made, uh, it was started by a woman who took... Um, the the uh, it's like an italian sommelier almost um for honey tasting uh they're i forget exactly what they're called but in, in italy there's like you you can get different uh rankings so it's like there's there's um 
vinegar sommeliers or you can be like a wine sommelier, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they, they actually have like a honey tasting organization in Italy um, that you can take. And she took their course and then came back to the States and wanted to bring that same concept here. Um, so she started uh, the American Honey Tasting uh, Society. And uh, you can go to her little farm. She keeps some bees and she actually has a really good honey collection there. And then for the course, um, she will bring honey samples from Italy, uh, similar to the ones that they that they would use in their course over there. Um, so she she gets a whole variety, and you basically spend two days. Um, they'll put some stuff in front of you. They'll tell you what it is. You'll take tasting notes for it, uh, and then uh, you'll do pairings. You'll uh, you'll do all these different things, and then later on, like as, as the course kind of progresses through the day and and through the weekend, and I think there's there's a couple different levels you can take, but um, you'll go back and they'll do blind taste testings or they'll blend two honeys together and you'll have to guess which ones they are. Mm. And it, and it, it, and it's a really intensive course where they kind of force you to think about everything that's happening around you. Um, and I think a lot of the people that took it were, um, they worked at apiaries or they worked for honey companies, um, or they were chefs. Uh, and it was a lot of people trying to develop the palates, but I was the only mead maker in that course. Um, oh, wow. And it, yeah, and it, it, it it's actually like, a, and I'm sure other mead makers have taken other classes from her, but um, it was it was it's it's a type of course that I feel like a lot of people could benefit from. Um, they they just haven't seen it, and the, you do a little bit of that at the UC Davis course, but it's not quite as intense because you're covering so many op- uh, other topics at the same time. Um, yeah. uh, the only downside to it, I would say, is that eating that much honey in, in two days. Like I, I woke up on Monday and I felt like I had the worst hangover of my life because it was just nonstop sugar. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow, it, it, and it, it, it was really cool. And it was, it was, a, it was a really good opportunity to taste honeys that I've never had before. So I, I, I think a couple of you guys have been to the Mazer cup and I'm sure all of you have met Carvin at some point, but he, he's been traveling around lately with that, that honey tasting station that he's has with like 60 different honeys. And anytime somebody runs into him, I would highly suggest taking advantage of trying as many of those as possible because they're, you're going to yeah. be able to try these things that you've, you've never had before. So instead of spending hundreds of dollars on a barrel, like a five gallon bucket or a, a gallon bucket of this honey that may or may not be good to your tastes, You've got these people out there that are willing to offer you tastes of these or samples of these honeys that might end up being your next favorite thing. Yeah, you know, I, I you know, I, I'm a bourbon drinker, and when I buy a bottle of bourbon, you know, that's, you know, I, before I got really into it, I mean, a lot of bourbons taste the same, and mm-hmm. uh, this this whole thing, uh, I, I started following this guy on YouTube, Chris Trevino. And he taught me a lot about bourbon, just watching his videos. And so I started buying all different labels of bourbons. I've, I've got probably 35 or 40 bottles of bourbon here of all different labels. But there was a method to my madness because I'm looking for the right bourbon to put to match with a meat or a brag. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, you know, once you learn, once you train your palate, uh, suddenly all these different bourbons, they all taste different. Uh, yeah. Different bourbons have different characters. And, I'm, you know, I started thinking, geez, you know, this might be good in this bracket, or this one might be good, you know, in that bracket. Uh, so that was kind of my m- method to this whole bourbon thing, similar to this honey tasting thing. Uh, Ryan, I think it would be fantastic uh, to have, um, maybe we should, you know, Carvin listens to the show. Carvin, I know you're listening. Uh, maybe we should get him to come to the next Iron B and bring his honey, uh, his honey tasting uh, kit with him. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I don't know. I think he might be coming up in September. I don't know if he's RSVP'd or not, but he might be coming up in September for Valkyrie's Horn. Excellent. And uh, I know both you guys are planning on being here for Valkyrie's Horn, so maybe we can um, we can do it then, and maybe we can do a recording session, yeah. you know, with him, you know, on site. Um, but yeah, if not, then hopefully, hopefully, if he doesn't make that 
that one, then um, he could make uh, Iron V twenty twenty. Yeah. Um, but that's uh, that's great. Um, Bert, thanks uh, for for coming on. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, it. Was amazing to taste your stuff. Hopefully, we'll we'll uh, get to meet you in person sometime soon. Kind of as a as a parting thought, it's kind of meat house tradition here to let uh, let everyone know uh, what you think is is uh, maybe an underappreciated aspect of uh, of making better meat in your own brew house. Oh man, um, I, I I really think that you just need to taste as many things as possible, and and I I feel like a lot of people, even people that are making mead, uh, are hesitant to spend. 20 or $30 on a bottle of something they've never had. But I, I mean, I did a beer trade with, uh, Brett Guthrie, the guy that get, that got second place in the R and B. Like we, I sent him a couple bottles of mine. I sent him my fenugreek and he sent me a couple bottles of his, including his fenugreek. And it, I, th- I think it's that kind of notion, like just share your stuff with as many people as possible and they'll share their stuff with yours and, and you'll get to taste more stuff. And that's where you'll get to learn what you do and don't like. And, I mean, you might have some bad stuff, but you're never going to get better if you just keep drinking your own thing, thinking it's the best thing in the world. So, unbelievable. I mean, that's what I that's what I try to do. <laughs> Good stuff. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I um just to just to bump onto that, what you were saying is try um you know as many honeys like you're saying, try as many honeys as you can, and and it's you know one of the honeys that. I think it was carrot blossom. There is a meadery that makes like a carrot blossom varietal and it's like mm-hmm. 30 bucks a bottle. Well, yeah. you can probably make your own, you know, for uh, a lot less than that, you know, if you want to. But the point is, yeah, I know those little like, you know, quarter ounce tasters of honey can seem expensive if you're doing it. But there, like I said, if, if you don't, if you can't find Carvin's roving honey tasting station, <laughs> Find a good honey importer or honey proprietor. Um, you know, there's a couple here in Minnesota I've talked about. You know, B, uh, Worker B is one of them. Yeah. Um, you know, some great ones across the country. But but try those samples out and then see uh, see what what you like. Good stuff. Hey, uh, yeah. Again, congratulations, Bert, uh, on the uh, on the Iron Bee first place. Uh, at the first Iron B, and uh, uh, you know, thanks for sticking. I don't know. We kept you a little longer than what we said, but man, Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 man, that's our fault. I mean, I, we, we love talking to you. I mean, you know, when conversation just you know keep on, keep on, keep on. Uh, you know, I kind of, I kind of produce a show here, and I've got contact with the guys with Jeff and Ryan. And it's just like, just let's keep on rolling, man. I mean, this good information, you know, I hate to shut it off. Uh, totally. you know, well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I mean, I, I definitely learned some, I think I'm going to, I'm going to check out this black swan stuff now. Oh my God. Yeah. You got to try that and, uh, try, try that maple. Unbelievable outcome. Let it sit in there for at least six, seven weeks, eight weeks, whatever you want. Uh, uh, I got outstanding results from it. So, uh, again, Bert, thank you so much. Awesome. Take care, and we'll talk soon. Yeah, have a good night, guys. All right. Um, holy cow, guys. <laughs> you know, another winner. Uh, thank you to uh, Bert Mayer for uh, coming on the show, talking about his, you know, I never thought about putting, you know, what about, I mean, it doesn't have to be fenugreek. What if you just dropped a couple of vanilla beans into your boche, into your boil? Ryan, I mean, what, you know, what? Or Jeff, I mean, uh, go to Jeff. Let me throw this over to Jeff. Uh, yeah, well, actually, you know? the first boche I made, I um, I did some, um, I threw a vanilla bean in a little one-gallon batch. It was probably technically late primary instead of actually secondary, um, and it got a good flavor. I enjoyed the caramelized honey and the vanilla together. Um, uh, many of my friends thought it was really nice as well, and so... Yeah, I'd, the vanilla and the caramel go together really nicely. Yeah. The idea of, you know, bocheting the uh, the vanilla or the, the, bocheting the honey with the vanilla bean in it is an interesting concept. I'm I'm curious as to how much like flavor extraction you're going to get out of it. Um but yeah, no, that that's definitely a possibility there. 
Well, you know, uh, Ryan, I've got this thing going on in one of my cupboards in my kitchen. I've got two quart jars filled with, uh, with wildflower honey. And they're also filled with, uh, uh, medium toast oak cubes, American oak cubes. They've been in there for, oh my God, probably a year. Uh, <laughs> You know, the whole idea was, um, you know, barrel-aged honey. Well, guess what? Every time I go in there to take a spoonful, it doesn't taste anything like any kind of wood at all. Uh, so uh, now I'm thinking, you know, since Bert uh, mentioned that he dropped his fenugreek into his, his boiling honey, maybe I should drop the wood into this into a, some uh, boche and see what happens. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm on board. I, you know what I did recently? I was doing a, um, an orange mead that I was using orange blossom honey with and, mm-hmm. um, and orange peels. So dried orange peels I had purchased, yeah. um, you know, from, uh, Mountain Rose Herbs. And the, I only, I boiled them in water for, maybe five minutes, you know, in a, in a, in a grain bag or, you know, a, a, a strainer bag. And I pulled it out, you know, and, um, you know, then I used that water, you know, and the water cooled, I added the orange blossom honey and, and fermented that. Well, that, that grain bag also had, uh, just, it still smelled so much like orange. I'm like, I'm not going to, there's mm-hmm. still a lot of good stuff in this. So I put it into a, into a Mason jar and then filled it up with vodka to try to create like this, you know, orange peel extract. Mm -hmm. And then I took one of, I had a soft maple, um, spiral from our friends, uh, and, and, um, from barrel mill. And I had two Mason jars going and I dropped, uh, the, the spiral of, of the soft maple in there because the soft maple is also supposed to give some, a little bit of an orangey flavor. And I thought that the uh, right. orange peel plus the soft maple uh, would create like a really interesting tincture that I could kind of use to finish off something with. And, uh, and I look forward to kind of using that. Yeah. You know, uh, experimentation is what it's all about. And, uh, you know, Bert Mayer, uh, he's doing his thing back there in Massachusetts for sure. Hey, yeah, before we get to segment two, uh, let's do this. Uh, Hey, the Cascade Beer Candy Company, you know what produces syrups that will add a unique flavor to your handcrafted beer or mead. Uh, Their syrups are made from 100% pure cane sugar for purity and incredible flavor. Each small batch of handmade syrup is slow cooked to give your beer or mead a distinct flavor such as toffee, vanilla, plums, and raisins. Uh, they produce uh, clear, blonde, and amber and dark style syrups, traditional type syrups. Uh, these products can use to fortify any beer, such as imperial IPAs, English style strong ales, so on and so forth, Belgian ales, and whatnot. But hey, that's not the only thing. Besides the traditional candy syrups, you got to try toasted coconut or the vanilla molasses bourbon. They've got over a dozen flavors. You can find them at Cascade Beer Candy dot com you need to stop by there and get some we'll put the link in the show notes um and to uh, to that guys i've got a project going in uh, one of the fermenters one of the twins and uh you know we we had them on the show here i don't remember what episode it was uh it's been a while back uh but uh we talked about that uh, bourbon bacon candy syrup well they sent me like four pounds of this stuff and i, I you know I, I i thought what am i going to do with this so I, I finally came up with a braggot project and uh i put about a pound and a half in it high krausen as recommended uh it's still fermenting actually it's not it's done fermenting i'm cold crashing now uh, in the fermenter at uh, roughly 39 to 40 degrees. You can ask me later how I did that. I might talk about that in segment two. But at any rate, hey, uh, CascadeBeerCandy.com, you got to stop by there and and pick some up. Hey, um, I'm going to throw the mic over to Jeff. Uh, I got an email from him earlier. It looks like a couple of Keyholder 
club members and uh, and uh, looks like Brett Guthrie, uh, our second place winner at Iron B, had a couple of questions they posted up, Jeff, on on uh, either Patreon or I guess the Facebook, uh, and we're talking fermenters here, right? And storage. yeah, fermenters so, and storage, so, I guess. Yeah, fermenting and storage. Uh, and, well, so uh, yeah, Bert Buffery sent me a, a message um, saying, "Hey, you know, had a, a question I wanted to throw out to the show." Um, so let's let's pull that up here, um, and I'll read the text of it. Uh, but, uh, come on, we'll play so that Jeopardy music is, here. I'm looking to up my fermenter game. <laughs> I'm currently using Speedles. I checked out one of your sponsors, Spike Brewing, and long story short, I'm looking for some highlights in equipment as to what you look for. Mm -hmm. um, the unit tank I'm looking at uh, is being able to carve in the tank. That really catches my eye. Um, so what do, you, yeah. what do you guys look for in getting a fermenter? What kind of features, what kind of uh, uh, you know baseline stuff? What's your thought process there? Um, I started out with a plastic bucket. I think like everybody, um, uh -huh. you know, you, you go out, you do your research. Uh, a lot of these, uh, brewing places have all the equipment that you need. Uh, and when I went to my local home brew shop, you know, they, they, you know, put a whole kit together. I mean, the, you know, the, the plastic, you know, the big seven gallon plastic bucket and, uh, funnels and man, just everything I needed, you know, to get started. And I used that the first few times. Um, and then I had this fear because back then I was very anal about cleanliness. And, uh, I mean, I would scrub my kitchen down to what was like an operating theater. I mean, everything in the place was sanitized. And the one thing I kept reading about these plastic containers was is if you scratch them, uh, you can risk the chance of a uh, a disease, <laughs> you know, some kind of bacteria. I guess that's a better word. Uh, getting into it, and and you may not be able to get it clean enough to to get it all out. So that that was always on my mind every time I used it. Uh, even when you use the the stirring wand that has the little two plastic wings on the side. Uh, and, you know, you're spinning that thing around inside, and if you, you, you hit the side of the wall of that plastic bucket, you could score the wall uh, pretty good with it. So that was always in the back of my mind. Uh, and then I discovered um, SS Brutech, uh, and they had uh, this little fermenter, little seven gallon uh, fermenter. Uh, it came, uh, you know, the accessories, uh, uh, with it came, you know, you could get this cooling, uh, uh, insert, uh, this immersion cooler that would go down inside of it. Uh, and they even had extension tubes for it. So if, you know, if you did a smaller batch than say five gallons, say you did a three gallon batch, I could still get this immersion cooler down inside the liquid. Uh, that was a hell of a setup. And so that's what I start out, uh, you know, I, I changed from the plastic bucket to the stainless steel. Um, and I got two. I was so happy with the first one. I bought a second one. That's why I call them the twins. They sit side by side on my, and I'll throw a picture up in the show notes uh, of my little setup. Uh, they sit side by side, and that's what I brew in now. Now, they do just fine. They're easy to clean. I like the stainless steel because they are easy to clean. Um, every once in a while, every, like every, maybe every fourth or fifth back batch, I'll scrub it down with PBW and then re, uh, you know, re sanitize. I mean, I sanitize them, at, you know, before I use them before every batch, but, uh, I do it once I fill it all the way. I set it in the bathroom. I fill it all the way to the top and put star sand in it and let it sit in there for about an hour and I dump it all out. Uh, and then after that, uh, I just rinse it out really good. I don't use the PBW in it. I just, you know, clean, clean water and a soft, uh, a soft sponge, uh, and get, uh, you know, get it uh, cleaned out and then I'll re-sanitize it again before I use it. That's how I do mine. Um, I've been looking at, uh, the spike brewing. Now they've come out with a new, fermenter and i don't have the website pulled up right now but it, it it's a um it will do the unitank uh 
Uh, you can carbon it if you get all the right attachments. Uh, but while I'm going into a lot of detail there, uh, that's what I'm typically doing. Ryan, I'll, I'll toss it over to you, bud. Uh, um, what are you doing for ferment? Yeah, so I don't keg, and I don't I don't typically keg, and I don't typically do fruit bombs. So I don't need really big uh, fermenters. Um, you know, I had done glass in the past, um, and now in primary I use uh, plastic. Um, they're plastic fermenters. They're not not buckets. They're they're clear, which I love because I can see um, you know see them clearing or and and just kind of I like to keep an eye on them that way. Uh, the biggest thing for me is I what I love about them is that they're siphonless. So I'm in when I'm in primary, um, all I all I have to do is is uh, you know I sanitize the spigot you know, with a spray bottle of sanitizer. I put a, a sanitized hose on it. And, and it goes, you know, right into either a bottling bucket or a carboy, you know, for, for longer term aging. Um, you know, look, you said you had spite elves. Um, those are, there is nothing wrong with those at all. I mean, you're saying up your game. I mean, that, that's a pretty up game. I mean, I've, I've, I've been to world class mead makers houses. I mean, ones that, whose names you hear a lot who are using spadels. So I, mm. I mean, there's, there's actually nothing wrong with those whatsoever. Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, those are, those are even higher quality than what I'm using. And, and you know, I, I, I'm fine with what I have. Um, biggest thing for me is yeah, I, I do, I do primary in, um, in plastic and, and I love the siphonless, uh, siphonless of them. It's like, if I'm, if I am doing a, a session or something that doesn't need to age, I don't even I don't use a siphon at all because I go from primary, uh, you know, into a bottling bucket, and the bottling bucket's got a spigot on it, and I just you know, and I just go from that into the bottle. So um, I like that. You don't have to worry about you know using an auto siphon or or anything else. Um, but I, I think what you're getting a little flavor of here is to each their own. Everybody's got their own way of of uh, of what they like to do. Yeah. Yeah, well, Jeff, what do you do? What, what are you using? So I also have a uh, SS Brutech. I don't think it's quite as uh, fancy in terms of features as the twins there, J.D. Uh, but <laughs> uh, a couple years back, I was a judge for a local competition. And, you know, just a, another <laughs> shout out for the Iron Bee and Ryan's ridiculously hard work at this. Um, this competition, there was one judge's prize. It was an SS Brutech brew bucket, um, which I... I totally recommend for, you know, people that are looking to get into stainless steel or just like the stainless steel because the price point is very, very nice. The basic model runs $200. The, like the Brewmaster version, which is the one I have with the integrated temperature probe and, and a couple extra features is like 230 um, It's a very accessible price point if you like stainless steel. Um, so, yeah, no, the... That was the one prize uh, for judges at this competition, uh, and I just have to take it home. Um, Iron B had so many prizes and was so huge; uh, it, I, it still blows my mind. Um, so, Ryan, hats off to you again for for all your hard work there. Um, so, I have the one stainless steel. I make obviously more than five gallons at a time. Um, I'm still using plastic for for some of my stuff. Uh, the basic seven gallon buckets you were talking about earlier, JD, I've got a few of those running for smaller projects. I try to keep the ones like, uh, let's say the bigger, the more important ones like that, uh, the golden strong that we were talking about at the start of the show, mm -hmm. that one went into stainless steel, um, sessions and, uh, lighter stuff or stuff that I'm not as attached to or conceptually yeah, that, that that's fine for plastic. Um, I like the stainless steel an awful lot just from a cleanliness standpoint, um, I don't generally need to do a lot to clean it up. I mean, I, uh, I, I stick it either over the, the bathtub faucet or, you know, our, our sink has one of those little spray nozzles. Um, so I can kind of tip it sideways to get that in there. Um, yeah. a little hot water is most of what it takes to get rid of, you know, any residual trub and yeast crud. Um, the, uh, sometimes I'll fill it up and let it soak if I've got a really, you know, pernicious sticky ring of like the Krausen and um, yeah. hoppy stuff there. Um, 
but yeah, no, you hit it with a little soap and a, a soft sponge, um, passivate it with some, um, some star sand and you're good to go. Yeah. Um, it, it's really nice, really durable. Um, you know, I, I probably go through one or two of these seven gallon buckets a year. Um, I just kind of, I do enough batches in them and go, uh, now, uh, if I do another, I'm, I'm probably taking a chance. You know, they they get a little scratched on the inside, or um, they're they're just starting to show their age. Um, it, it feels like it's time to relegate that guy to you know PBW and cleaning bottles instead of uh, yeah. uh, making meat in. So, um, the, uh, yeah, long and short of it, I really like that SS Brutech. Uh, really, really easy to clean. The bells and whistles uh, for Spike sound really nice. Uh, being able to carbonate in the, yeah. the vessel like a like a bright tank at a brewery or a unitank at a brewery um, sounds really cool. And, you know, it, if I remember right, Spike is a subsidiary of Blickman um, or uh, something I, of that nature. So the I, quality yeah, level is going to be there. Yeah, and I, um, you know the the other the fermenter I I landed on their site the, the fermenter one of the fermenter I was talking about and I've, actually I'm actually taking a serious look at uh, it's called a flex fermenter now they start at 250 bucks if you just get the basic model uh, I'm not going to go through all the details about it. you can go to spikebrewing.com and and look them up uh, but that's to to me that's like the next step up for me to get into something like that. If you get the correct, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a whole a whole list of accessories that you can get for it. Yes, you can actually carb inside this flex fermenter if you get the right lid, uh, you know, that comes with it. Um, now, you can't carb at, you know, 40 pounds per square inch. Uh, that ain't going to cut it. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you carb at, you know, normal pressure, like, I don't know, you know, five, six pounds, you, you can get the carbonating stone that goes down and out. It'll take you a little bit of time. This is not an overnight thing where you take the keg and roll it around on the floor for 20 minutes, you know, at 50 pounds of pressure and voila, you have a carbed, you know, uh, but it is very functional. The other one that they have for $525 is the conical fermenter a seven gallon they've got larger ones there uh, very functional this one actually has a trub dump on it to where you can dump your trub and leave it uh, use it as a secondary as well a lot of beer, beer brewers uh, do that uh the flex fermenter you can't do that there's no trub dump uh but uh, i tell you both of them uh are are really sweet looking and reasonably priced. So, um, you know, like Ryan says, uh, the plastic fermenters, what, what, was, what was the one that we gave away, Ryan, at the Iron B? Uh, looked awesome. In fact, who, who, who's using it? Matt Whitey or somebody? I was the catalyst fermenter, and that was um, given to us, uh, donated by uh, O'Connor's uh, Homebrew and Homebrew's Fly and uh josh mahoney ended josh. up with that i know he's got a batch in it right now so we'll we'll see how um uh what he, what he ends up with uh in there yeah. i know uh, i think i pegged him and said i wanted a bottle of whatever he was brewing in there yeah <laughs> um uh jeff you had another one yeah yeah let me uh let me move on to that one real quick here uh, let's see so this is from mike uh miller and uh, he says, um, kind of in a similar sense, what's the best for fermenting and storing meat? Um, he gives four options. Food grade plastic containers, stainless steel fermenters, glass demi johns, or wooden barrels. Any help would be appreciated. So maybe let's divide this up into fermenting versus storing. Thoughts? Yeah, I think we I think we actually just did a pretty good job of talking about fermenting. So I don't know if we we need to spend too much more yeah. time on that. Um, let's go to storing. Um, my question would be, what is the purpose of storing the mead? Is it because you want it to sit on oak for an extended period of time or um, different spices for for additional period of time or um, 
you know, you just want to, you don't have space to bottle or, or whatever. Um, I think that once a meet is done, uh, and I'll, I'll put an asterisk on done, but once the meat is done, getting it in the bottle is the safest place to put it because it's not going to be exposed to any uh, any opportunities, any further opportunities for something funky to happen to it. Now, when I say "quote unquote" done, you know, I, I I'm there the asterisk on done. I'm going back to something that uh, Adam Bystrom said last week when he was talking about. He said he had this this meat in the carboy, and he said he played with it. You know, he added like four different things, you know, oak and spices and fruits or something and he's like you know what I just got to be done I got to be done or I'm just gonna this, I'm just gonna keep kind of messing with it and there's two things with that number one if you keep messing with it you know, the chance you're gonna overdo it and the more you mess with it um, the more opportunities you give for something funky to happen to it I know that we stress um, we stress sanitary you know practices and and mm-hmm. keeping oxygen off of it um, but you know, the more you, you open it up and play with it, you know, you, you allow for both those two things to happen. So when the meat's done, there's no safer place to put it than in the bottle. Now, if you don't have space or bottles or room, you can bulk age. Sure. But, but again, now think about why are you bulk aging? Is it just because you don't have enough space for bottles or you don't have enough bottles or is it because, you know, you want it to be on, on spices or oak or, or things like that? Um, my standard is glass. I keep it in glass. Uh, you know, carboys are great. You can minimize the oxygen. You can uh, keep an eye on it. Um, get a carboy handle. They're, they're easy to move around. Um, now, I, I already know what, what JD is going to say, and I'm the only reason I'm not uh, saying that with him is because I don't have that setup. Yeah. But if I did have that setup, yeah. I think that, that JD's system of pressurized kegs is another incredible yeah. and safe way to, uh, to store your meat. Why are they safe, Ryan? Why, why well, is two it? options. The, the car the carboy is not going to shatter. Number one, they, and if you keep five and if you keep five pounds of pressure on it, you don't have to worry about it getting oxidized. There you go. Yeah. We've both experienced. Right on both counts. Yeah, we've well, we've both experienced the uh, the broken carboy syndrome. Ryan, a little worse than I have, but hey, you can check out uh, previous shows for rundowns on that. So. <laughs> But yeah, I, you know, um, I, I have to agree with Ryan. Depends on where you want to wind up and what you're doing. Uh, you know, I, I I've moved to the keg thing because I've listened to Ryan twice now uh, with uh, with an accident at home with a glass carboy. I had one here at home. And I thought, no, uh, my old feeble hands full of arthritis. The last thing I need is a drop, a five gallon glass carboy on the floor full of of mead and so i started going to kegs um easy to store they're tall they're skinny uh you know in in the space of one five gallon glass carboy i can get two kegs um you know so uh, that's my thing now i've got some stuff in wooden barrels that have been in there for a while i just told you about the stout that i racked it was in there for 10 uh, for 10 months um you know right now it's I fill it back up again with five gallons of bourbon. Uh, it'll stay there until I'm ready for my next project. Um, wooden barrels. I mean, if you're looking for that barrel flavor or whatever you want to do, I mean, we've talked about that here on the show, uh, and I've done that. Um, so uh, stainless steel and and kegs. Uh, I'm an all steel. Uh, my my brewery is all steel now. So uh, Jeff, that's uh, yeah, that's what I'm doing. So. Man, I'm gonna. I'm going to second Ryan here. Glass and kegs or steel or whatever, um, they're, they're the way to go. Um, the, the one thing I would throw in is a word of caution. Don't, don't, uh, don't plastic for long-term storage. Um, yeah. You get a level of micro-oxidization, uh, just a little bit of gas exchange through the walls of the plastic. Um, that may be what you're looking for. And a barrel will do the same thing. It's just a very tiny amount of oxidization over time. The longer you leave it in there, the the more chance you get to it. Um, but if, if I remember what I've read previously, and I could be dead wrong on this, uh, most of the, the standard, like, 
number two food grade plastic we get allows a lot more of that than a barrel does even. So mm -hmm. um, kind of a case of I just want something stable and safe that I can put my stuff in, let it sit and mature as it will uh, without a lot of outside influence and come back to it and go, hmm, there it is. That's, that's what I wanted. Or, you know, maybe, hey, it needs a little more oak. It needs a little more time. Mm -hmm. That's okay, too. Uh, that's my thought process on it. Yeah. Cool. Now, you had a third one uh, from Chris Deards. Uh, I guess you got a hold of him on Facebook. Uh, something about um, measuring honey. Uh, I'll let you take it away. Sure. He just asks, uh, what's your method to measure amount of honey you need? Honey sticks to everything. It's hard to get out every last drop from containers. And uh, I, I have some thoughts on this. You, I have previously mentioned in the past, but I have stopped weighing my honey. I just add it a little at a time until I get the significant gravity that I want. Um, you know, what are you guys' thoughts about measuring honey and getting it into fermenters? The same. I, I, I don't measure it anymore. I know, I, I tell you what, I, there's a food supply place, uh, a restaurant supply place right up the street from where I live. And my whole kitchen is outfitted with industrial pots and pans. Uh, I go there for all of my kitchen needs. And I have this ladle, okay? Uh, it holds two pounds of honey. How do I know that? Well, because I filled it full of honey and weighed it. So I know that at least, you know, if I fill that ladle up and put it into the the uh, kettle or, or whatever I'm, I'm doing, I know that's two pounds. So if I, if I put two in, I know that's four pounds. Uh, now, my recipes, of course, are based on ounces and pounds of ingredients. Uh, and so that gives me a head start. But after that, uh, I'm like you, Jeff, uh, from then on, once I get close, uh, I, I use the hydrometer. Ryan? Yes, I've done this uh, two different ways. Um, you know, my recipes are based on pounds as well. Uh, so I, you know, I've got one fermenter that um, is kind of marked. And so I know, okay, this is, you know, three pounds of honey is going to get it about here. Six pounds of honey is going to get it about here. Ten pounds of honey is going to get it about here. And so I kind of eyeball in that, you know, try to hit that mark. And I know you're at a pretty good spot to start. And then you can, and then you can go from there. The other fermenter I haven't done that with. And I guess there's no real hurry to, cause I, uh, but I, uh, just put it on a scale. I just drop the fermenter on the scale. I zero it out, and then I put honey in it until it it hits that that point. You know of what I'm looking for. You know, say one three pounds of honey, six pounds of honey, you know, whatever, ten pounds of honey, and then um, measure it up. Draw, take the refractometer and and get it get it pretty close, and and then see if I need to do any adjustments. Like Jeff and I talked about on an earlier episode, I mean, if, if you're off by a couple of points, it's not a big deal for me. You know, if I'm even, if, like I said, if I'm even for 1070 and I hit 1069 or 1072, it's, it's, uh, it's not, not an issue. Um, so, Absolutely. you know, it, it's, that's where, that's where I'm at. Um, the second part of his question was, it's hard to get a little dropout. Uh, well, I, I get honey in two different ways. Most of the honey that I get is in five gallon buckets or, or uh, once in a while, maybe a three gallon bucket or something. And then, uh, you know, those like three pound, you know, or something like plastic containers or glass containers. Well, those are easy, right? Cause you, you know, you put some hot water in them, you, you give it a good shake and you pour it out, do that two or three times and, and it's clean. Um, with the big buckets, you know, let's say I've got a five-gallon bucket and it's full of honey, and I get down and I put on the I put it on the on the scale and let's say there's you know seven pounds of honey left in it. Well, that's great because then all I do is I I fill that up with water and uh, and mix it up and use that as the primary. <laughs> there you I, go. I do my primary right in that right in the five-gallon bucket to make sure you you know get the last last out of that. So that's the that's way I do it. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, go ahead, Jeff. I have a, 
I have a crazy idea as far as making a no muss, no fuss um, honey transfer from those five gallon buckets to the uh, you know whatever fermenter you're using, provided you have a counter you know space to just set this bucket on the edge of in your your brew shop. Um, have either of you guys ever heard the term honey gate? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So. I the, the way the honey gate works, basically, you know, we're talking about these five-gallon buckets of honey, and a lot of the apiaries or the, the beekeepers, they'll harvest, they'll put their honey in these five-gallon buckets, but then they've got to fill the little eight-ounce and one-pound honey bears to sell at market or whatever. Right. How do you do that? There's a little, it, it's a very simple, like, little guillotine-style valve. They just stick at the bottom of that bucket. It opens, it closes. There's a little wing nut to keep it closed. Um and it occurred to me the other day as I was kind of browsing through some beekeeping catalogs, you know, I've got a couple empty buckets from honey just sitting around. Yeah. I can slap a couple of these uh, um, these honey gates on it, and then they make a specific bracket mm-hmm. so that uh, you can set a largely full or partially full honey bucket on top of another bucket and let it just let time take its course to drain out. Yeah. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these two empty buckets. Um, next time I get another bucket, I'll have a honey gate on it. I'll set it up. I'll let it, let the new bucket drain out into the old one. I'll mark the old one with, you know, a piece of tape and say orange blossom, avocado, whatever. Um, get all of that good honey out of the new bucket. Maybe put a new, uh, honey gate on it. So I have an extra one. Um, and then all I'll need to do is basically set the, the, the bucket with the honey gate on top of my counter, put my fermenter or wherever I'm mixing stuff up under it, open the gate and Bob's your uncle. That's a better idea than my, than my dipper thing. I mean, two pounds of honey, that's actually quite a bit of honey. Uh, So you can imagine how big that, how big my dipper is. Okay. It's like, like, like three cups, uh, something like that. Uh, well, and so, I'm sure like you've probably had the same problem I've had using dippers and transfer spoons. You get those little tendrils of honey that oh, God, start to add up over time. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. you know, you're spending a half hour to an hour, like just cleaning after you got just, your must mixed in your, your yeast pitch, a more yeah. elegant solution, I think. So yeah, I'm going to try this. I'll post some photos or something on the website and see, uh, see how that works out. And, um, Shoot, I can I can even send you some links to stuff on Amazon to pick up, and if you guys want to try that at home, yeah, you know you can you can get those honey. I think you can get you you can buy those honey gates off of Amazon. I think right. Sure, and you just I, have I, to I, drill out the. You have to drill the yeah, bucket, the, right? Right. the The most complicated part is getting a little hole saw drill bit that will handle like I think it's an inch and a half or two inches, something in that ballpark. Um, the it, it's not difficult to install from everything I've seen. So yeah. uh, this seems like a great project to kind of just up my cleanliness in the brew house game. Um, yeah. Let me, uh, let me send you those. I think I've seen them like two for 10 bucks or something like that. Real oh, darn cheap. cheap. Yeah. This brackets another eight. Um, you know, th- th- at the end of the day, it's more effort than expense. Well, I'm just thinking that the next accident that Ryan's going to have is actually dumping over a five-gallon bucket of honey on the floor, and uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll spend ten minutes hearing about that on on a future show sometime. So, <laughs> uh, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. Uh, while we've got some a uh, little bit of time here, guys, uh, let's turn it over to Facebook friends. Always love doing this. This is where we try to tackle a couple of questions from our, from our Facebook friends with no formal expertise other than what we've experienced in our very own brew house. Ryan, I know you got a couple of them uh, picked out there. Uh, what do you got? Yeah, so our first one is from Corey, and he is making um, a small batch of peach mead. So he's going to use some wildflower honey, and then he's got Vinter's Harvest Peach Puree. Mm. And uh, I'm going to forget the size of the can, you know, with the smaller can, uh, you know, I, I, again, I'd be 46, 46 ounce, ounces something. or something like that. Um, that ballpark, yeah. Yeah, right. And he wants to know um, how much he should use and, and if he, you know, in, in primary and secondary. 
Uh, now, I treat a lot of different fruits this way, but especially peach. Um, make your make a wildflower traditional. Make your wildflower traditional, and then add all of that peach in secondary, and uh, and it's going to hang out. Um, a little, it's, you're going to get more of that peach flavor, and it's going to be more identifiable as peach that way. I've used Venture's Harvest before. I've been pleased with their purees. Um, but, guys, more and more and more, I've been going to all my fruit additions in secondary. Um, and it's, I, I really like the result. Um, how about you guys? Whether, whether it's just overall, um, Melomels or or and or if you want to talk about peach specifically, I, I don't particularly do melomels. But here, here's the thing about the puree that I'll throw in there: uh, it's good that you add it in secondary because here's what happens: if you paint if you make it part of your original must and include that in say the the five gallon recipe that you're putting together. Mm-hmm. Um, what happens is that peach puree turns into a whole lot of trub at the bottom of the fermenter. And uh, what you wind up with is less than five gallons of of uh, must that you're going to rack into your you know whatever your your carboy or whatever. So I, I agree with Ryan. Put the put everything in secondary. Uh, that way you're adding to the five gallons. Uh, so you're going to wind up with more. Make sure you've got a vessel that's large enough uh, to hold it. Uh, obviously you're going to need something that's probably better than five gallons. Uh, at least that way you'll be able to capture more back, Jeff. Uh, that's all I got on that one. I've used Vintner's Harvest once. Um, well, I like, I, I've used it three times. And the one that really sticks out to me right now is, uh, the, like the juniper grapefruit that I made recently. Um, cause it's still in secondary in a little glass jug. I just made a one-gallon batch. And what really irks me is that, yeah, no, there's a lot of trub in there. I, mm-hmm. I I should rack it off of this stuff, but it's a loose trub. It's not like a nice compact yeast cake. Um, I, I move it, and it wiggles. Um, and it's almost a third of this gallon. Yep. So I know I'm going to face some losses, and I don't have a two-third gallon fermenter. I don't even have a half-gallon little carboy i can set it in to see to do secondary so yeah no i wish i had just waited and done it in secondary like jd suggests and for future reference i totally will <laughs> um and that said you know i i still like to put fruit in primary just because i feel like giving the yeast a good chance to chew on it like really uh it it, it feels more pure in spirit but, you know, I, from everything I've heard, you also get a lot more of that fruit flavor coming out, like, um, accurately or, or honestly um, put into secondary because that it does retain some of that fruit sugar. Yeah. Um, when it comes to peach, I've never tried it. I, I hear peach is really tough. And if I didn't anger enough people with my comment about barbecue last week... Um, <laughs> I may well hear when I say, I'm just not a big peach fan. <laughs> I don't you... like peaches that much. <laughs> there you go, Ryan. Maybe, maybe uh, grill to take peaches and, <laughs> and grill them up and get a nice caramelization. Hey, that and, I haven't and tried. It. That, yeah. might be, that might be something. Well, um, yeah, I might try that for the fourth. <laughs> yeah. Our next one, uh, John wants to know if anyone's ever used hibiscus uh, in their meads, he's thinking of using uh, Nobody hibiscus here. mulberry or hibiscus <laughs> white tea. Now, I said uh, Jeff nope. and I have both talked about um, hibiscus a lot, and yeah. you know Jeff makes his his hibiscus chamomile, um, which is very good, and I, I make mm-hmm. a batch of hibiscus sizer every year. Um, so the only kind of way that I want to talk about this, because hibiscus is great, is how you've achieved the best flavor of the hibiscus. I usually um, get boiled, I'm sorry, uh, dried hi- dried hibiscus um, leaves or, or blossoms or whatever you want to call them. So dried hibiscus blossoms. And then um, make, a, make a tea out of them. So I do kind of a hot tea and then... Um, 
you know, draw out their flavors that way. I think, uh, Jeff, you, you don't though. I think you, um, uh, add them, uh, you don't add heat. You don't, you don't use heat on them. Is that, is that correct? Um, it, it really depends actually. And I will say, I always use dry hibiscus. If you are fortunate yeah. enough to live in a, a part of the country like Hawaii where you can source enough like fresh hibiscus to do that, try it and let me know. Uh, <laughs> Um, so my, my hibiscus game is kind of twofold and it really depends on what I want. If I'm doing like a really wine strength, um, kind of, um, a, a meat that I, I want the hibiscus to be like the only star other than the honey or like the major flavor component, I absolutely make a tea. Um, I, I recently made, um, you know, the, the annual, my wife needs some hibiscus mead. Um, and I, I've been playing with the amount of hibiscus I put in there. I did a hundred grams to a gallon, uh, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're talking about dried flowers, that's a ton. Um, and it, it is a damn powerful hibiscus flavor. Um, so I, I think in future batches, I may scale it back a little bit. Um, if we're talking about like a, uh, a sizer or something where the hibiscus is like just you know adding a little secondary note it, it's a uh, it's adding some tartness and some color i'll just add that in secondary and kind of let it hang out um but yeah if you really want a pronounced hibiscus flavor the tea is the way to go you're, you're getting all of the extraction you can out of it that way excellent awesome. good um what else? and then here's the last one i've got um, JD, do you have a thought on hibiscus? Or I, no. I didn't think you were no. into the the flowery no. meats. No, 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 no. Flower, <laughs> flower, flowers, flowers for weddings and funerals. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, and edible salads. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, so the last one is is David. Uh, and David was listening to our show. And just had to make the Mountain Dew mead. And so he posted some pictures here. He's doing a one gallon batch. I think he's in a couple of one gallon batches. You know, three pounds of honey. Good stuff. Um, so. You know, the rest of the way up with Mountain Dew that's, that's been flattened. You know, so you get all yep. the carbonation out of it. Uh, nutrients, energizer, and yeast. Uh, and then uh, a little bit of food coloring. You know, if you want to want to get that nice, uh, you know, a, a neon green color, green, yeah. but he is, he's going at it. It's, um, it's a fun one. Uh, he said his starting gravity was, was 1149. He's using the champagne yeast. This is one of the only meats I've ever had to make a starter for, uh, just to make sure I got a really good fermentation off the bat. But no, Dave, David, this is uh, this is a fun one. I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, let us know how it turns out. Um, I, you know, I, I posted a picture of mine um, on his post, and then it's also, you know, if you go to the, the Facebook photos, you can see a bottle of my my neon green mutant blood. But yeah, it's just a little something fun to end with. You know, why not make a meat out of Mountain Dew? Hey, you know what? Uh, send us pictures uh, and let us see what it looks like. Uh, love to see it. All right, guys, uh, we're going to wrap it right there. Hey, uh, again, special thanks to our guest today, home mead maker and Iron Bee winner, Bert Mayer, for stopping by the house. Uh, a lot of fun talking to him today. Got to get him back on the show. Love the way he loves to experiment with things. Uh, good stuff. But, hey, in the meantime, happy mead making. We want you to have a great and safe 4th of July, and that's going to be it for this episode. Hey, Ryan, flip them lights off, Jeff. Slam that door shut. Hey, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Remember, we're on hiatus for, for a couple, uh, but in a couple of weeks, look for episode number 131 of The Meat House. In the meantime, hey, we're gone. We're gone.